Hello there. Welcome to the Maker Manager Money Podcast, a podcast about entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, founders, business owners, and business partnerships, from startups to stay ups, to inspire entrepreneurs to keep going and future entrepreneurs to just start. My name is Kyle Knowles, and it's a Saturday morning in London, England. We are recording in the White City House. My guest this morning is Jeanette Oku. Jeanette is the founder and CEO of Beyond Influence, an influence and brand ambassador marketing agency, helping clients ride the next wave of marketing. Jeanette is a champion and an independent thought leader on social and emerging technologies with a track record of building and implementing effective integrated marketing and communication initiatives by putting data and storytelling front and center. She is keen to unite her clients with influencers and ambassadors meaningfully to achieve revenue, performance, and transparency. A journalist by training, with ears on the ground and a sharp eye, she has a deep understanding and infectious passion for all things digital and social. She has tapped emerging social technologies for small, medium, and Fortune 500 companies globally in the entertainment, automotive, luxury, and consumer product industries. She spent 20 years in the United States and extensive time in China and now resides in Europe, gaining knowledge and expertise of emerging trends in the social media space. Jeanette has had several senior management positions at various brands, agencies, and internet startups. Her key areas of expertise include not only firsthand knowledge in trending media, digital marketing, and social technologies, but also strong best-in-class strategy and business development. She is fascinated by how consumers think, behave, and interact with brands in our always-on world. Her personal goal is to devise strategies for brands which give the consumer something valuable in return for their attention. As a pioneer in the influence content creator marketing space, she holds numerous board positions as a former advisor, member of the American Influencer Council, and current member of the steering committee of the Branded Content Marketing Association in Great Britain. She is an executive board member of the German Influencer Marketing Council. Jeanette is also voted as one of the top 50 global influencer marketing professionals by the trade organization Talking Influence. She is a sought-after speaker, industry podcast guest, and host of the successful podcast Influence by Design. So as a fellow podcaster, welcome to the Maker Manager Money podcast, Jeanette. That was a mouthful, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Carl. So as an entrepreneur and pioneer in, and in influencer marketing, what inspired you to take the leap and start your own agency? Well, it's, it's never linear, um, as you might imagine. So I, as you already said, I come from journalism, and that meant that words, text, content is to me, the most important near and dear, actually, um, I'm talking about something that I haven't talked about in decades. I studied literature, actually. Um, I studied Russian and French literature. So you can see that the love for words and language um, has already been in my DNA. And uh, when I moved to the States, I didn't speak a word of English. Um, so I learned the language because I love to talk, as you can imagine, and uh, also love the language. So I, I, I never took any classes. I just watched reruns of Law and & Order and talked to the handyman in our building. And that's how I picked up the language. And now I'm writing articles and uh, doing podcasts in foreign languages. So, yeah, to me, Continuing journalism when I moved to the States uh, was not an option, so I explored other, other avenues, starting to consulting what um, brands should do who would come from abroad to the United States because I knew when they wanted to do PR what the journalists want to hear. And being the bridge builder culturally uh, gave me an advantage to help them launch in the United States. Um, and from there, when YouTube and Facebook started. I was hooked, had a startup as well that didn't make it in 2008 with a big crash. But the digital space was my was my route. And then in 2010, when Instagram emerged and Pinterest emerged, I just thought there's something there there with this whole influencer thing. It worked in several agencies to 
develop uh, strategies how to leverage social media and influencers already fairly early on. And then it was just a natural progression that eventually I would create my own agency. I'm just wondering like, if you could explain influencer marketing to people who don't understand. I mean, I think a lot of people understand what an influencer is, but what is influencer marketing and what do you do to facilitate influencer marketing? Sure. So you might be surprised, but influencer marketing is nothing new. Think of Santa Claus and Coca-Cola. Think of um, Babe Ruth. Think of the Queen's portrait on a porcelain cup. This is all influencer marketing. You use a persona, can be real or not real. Mickey Mouse, for example, it's not a real person, but it has a heft, it has an influence. Uh, these people have some gravity that other people, um, you know, navigate towards and, uh, and therefore they have, uh, they have power over purchasing power. So utilizing those in the various marketing verticals that there are, um, is a smart thing to do because people buy from people, people don't buy from brands. So that's basically it in a nutshell. And then it trickles down to, a lot of details, nuances, how to actually develop an influencer marketing strategy and implement an influencer marketing strategy. And uh, to me, the defining moment um, that influencer marketing became a thing is with the democratization of this one here, the iPhone, where all of a sudden the power of influence was given to well, let's say the common people like you and I. Thank you. I love that answer. Um, so if I w was a, a brand and I wanted to hire you to uh, have an influencer, uh, you know, uh, bring brand awareness to my brand, my company, my product, what are the steps that you go through uh, with a company to set that up for them? My, my short answer would be not one influencer. That doesn't do anything. That's an ambassadorship, like many brands do. They pick an ambassador who is the lightning rod for for their brand or for their product. Take Ronaldo or the Beckhams or you name it, any celebrity. That's not really what I'm talking about. That's a PR uh, communication um, measure. Um, in terms of influencer, there is in the meantime, it's pretty sophisticated now. So what I would do is I would ask, okay, <laughs> what's the brief, dear brand? <laughs> and then the answer would be, we don't have one. That's for agency always very, very big pain point. So then you have to first go and write that brief for the brand. So you know what to do. Um, and based on that, you then find people who match either the product or the brand who are good representatives of those people. That means that they not only have to be a fit um, visually, if we, we think Instagram, that needs to, needs to uh, align. You also need to take a look at um, reputationally. And we go very far back with when we look at some people, have there been any murky things happening. Have these people said anything? Are they clean and are they, are they safe to use for a brand? Because a brand for, for a brand, it's always about brand safety in the end. And then, uh, these influencers are give, influencers are given some details. Some brands like to almost dictate what these internet, uh, internet personalities are supposed to say. That's not the way to go. They should have their creative freedom. They should uh, know how to speak to their audience because that's how they grew. Um, and, uh, and then it's about how you, how you, uh, use these various people in various categories. First of all, I would ask, what's your budget? If you think influencer marketing is for free, just because the influencer can align with you, dear famous brand, that's not going to count anymore. Um, you need to shell out some substantial dough as I may say, if you really want to make a mark. And then uh, what I'd like to do is I would like to create um, a big awareness uh, situation with some bigger influencers. Um, then I will put a set of smaller ones underneath 
and then an even smaller one below that because those guys are going to convert if a brand wants to, I don't know, make sales, downloads, um, or have email newsletter signups, etc. The objective is always um, important as well. And then um, the way you set it up, you can measure it and then you can have some reporting in between. You find these influencers, uh, use technology to see who is the audience because that's the important thing. The influence is just the medium. So if I want to probably, you know, if, example, if I want to sell a lipstick, I'm L'Oreal, I'm launching a lipstick. I want to uh, target 18 to 24 year old girls in, let's say, Germany. And I have this influencer who has 3 million followers, German one. And the brand says, oh, that's going to, that's going to be a success. She has 3 million followers. Um, we're going to sell like hotcakes, those lipsticks. I go then use technology and may be able to find out that uh, 70% of the followers are middle-aged white men in Brazil because she has such beautiful long legs. So that means that the influencer is potentially still a candidate to work with because 13% of her audience is exactly the audience that I want to reach but she charges 25k for a post now knowing that 13 percent are only of interest to me gives me leverage to negotiate and if all goes well i can negotiate it down because i have a finite budget and then the whole process of um creating content, posting the content, gathering the insights, uh, also measuring if it really moved the needle in Germany within a particular age group then uh, comes to play. And that feeds into all the other marketing activities that are around this launch, paid media, events, everything that normal marketing or the other aspects of marketing also then kick in. So I, I know we're moving uh, in a direction with influencer marketing to more of that affiliate acquisition kind of style. So um, is it is it less expensive uh, to uh, hire influencers? And also uh, the other question I have is what are the numbers of followers that are sort of necessary to even get into to be an influencer? How many followers do you need to have to be an influencer? You can have 500 followers and you can be an influencer because you influence your vicinity. Those smaller ones are very attractive, what you just mentioned in terms of affiliate marketing, because they're higher converting, because oftentimes everybody knows each other. The influencer or the creator, um, it's also a term, TikTok, for example, calls their influencers creators. And more and more influencers would like to be called creators because influencer have sort of like a bad rap because of some some things that happened in recent years when we were still like, you know, like the Hulk bursting out of our t-shirts. Um, so you, it, it, the size doesn't matter really. It's about the, the influence that you have on your community. And that can be a small community. It can be a large community. And you mentioned already um, affiliate marketing and influencer marketing. I am very excited about this trend. I think this uh, actually will grow over the next few years because brands have come to the conclusion that they also want to see the ROI of their spend. Influencer marketing is not cheap. Some of these um, creators or influencers ask for hefty amounts for a post and the brands want to see what does it get me in the end. How is this measurable? And attribution in influencer marketing is actually a tough nut to crack because if I, influencer, have a product that I want to speak about, I get paid by, by a brand. I even get a, get a code that my audience can use to purchase a product. I have a UTM link that directly shows if somebody clicks on the link that I provide in my story, uh, then goes somewhere um, but that journey is not linear anymore what if if the if the visitor then falls off is not ready to purchase yet the the code doesn't work in a couple of months let's say if it's about a car that's a long purchasing process and uh, 
and then I can't attribute it to to the influencer because marketers measure last click. While potentially that influencer was the first one who brought it up to the attention of the purchase being made, of the person who made the purchase. So, uh, and with, with affiliate marketing, that problem is solved. Um, obviously, you need also technology that tracks that. The issue with that is that influencers who are somewhat aware of how they perform are hesitant to opt into those platforms because you need to have a direct connection to those technologies in order to be measurable. And that's the issue. So therefore, the affiliate piece is oftentimes very popular in smaller follower categories because um, you you give those people a an opportunity to make some money based on on the sales that you you basically bring into to the collaboration i know there's several channels like instagram uh, reels for example or youtube shorts there's uh, tiktok we've got all these different social media channels what do you find to be the best channel for influencer marketing also there's no <laughs> there's no one perfect answer um, i believe in that it is a it's an ecosystem And some very smart creators have figured it out. They know where their strength and they know where their weaknesses is. Um, TikTok, for example, is very great in creating awareness uh, around a younger audience, but also older folks are now on to TikTok. I, you know, I have my, my, my mother hanging out there. Now, will she be influenced to purchase something at her age? Probably not. But if an influencer is has a diverse presence in numer on numerous channels, they can then determine their own funnel, basically. Because if you create an awareness um, uh, aspect on TikTok, Instagram is still the more converting platform where you can then drive purchases, etc. I wouldn't underestimate Facebook for specific categories. Um, it's not so much out there anymore. It's more internally. Facebook uh, is bet betting very much on community. So that's um, something to take into account. And for sure, YouTube um, is a nature of force. And then there are others, Twitch, for example, very niche, very focused on either lifestyle or gaming. Uh, those two, I would count out potentially X, formerly Twitter, because it's a hostile environment for me. I'm never really considering that one. And there is LinkedIn also for B2B marketing, which is its own beast. Thank you. So uh, being an entrepreneur, you're on several boards, you've founded different companies. How do you Uh, how do you take care of yourself and what advice could you give to other entrepreneurs that are very busy? I know you're taking classes, you're doing all kinds of things. What's some advice you can give to entrepreneurs to take care of themselves and, and not get burned out? <laughs> okay, now it's getting personal. It's very, um, very interesting too. So yeah, well, I could, I could say, okay, I do yoga. I, do, I have a cat. And that cat sits oftentimes next to me when I have conference calls. I don't need the stress ball. I have my <laughs> stress fur. I just, you know, do this. It's very relaxing. But I um, I used to have three phones. And when I woke up in the morning, I had my phones basically glued to my hands, right? Like Aquaman. <laughs> and uh, I, I stopped looking at phones at least two hours before I go to bed. Stop doing it because it also is very helpful for for your sleep, right? You need to take a break. Um, and I, um, I started um, microdosing, which to me is fantastic. Um, I'm using it for focus and for creativity, which is uh, very important to me. And I've been doing this now for almost two years and I can highly recommend it because it makes me also more productive. Um, I said, I said, I set my timer for focused work and then take a break. And um, I do, as you just mentioned, also I do classes. Uh, I'm a, 
I'm a constant learner and I think that is very important. So your brain stays, um, stays nimble, uh, stays, you know, very, very flexible and, and limber. I wanted to talk to you just quickly about AI and how you're using AI on a personal level and uh, at, in your business as well. <clears throat> yeah, on a personal level, it's um, it's fairly easy. You can, you know, create um, with ChatGPT your own personal assistant. You put in your weekly or daily planner and AI is basically managing your schedule. If anything happens and a meeting is overrun, you can just communicate this with um, with your assistant chat <laughs> and he's adjusting the entire the entire um, schedule for you. I found though that it is more work for me to put in the changes throughout the day when I just you know just can just go with the flow. I still <laughs> and that's a confession I still love my handwritten calendar in front of me which I put together every morning. I write down what I need where I have my fixed um, calls and meetings and then my to-dos that I have to do whenever I, I, I get to it. I'd like to check it off. I check it off with red. So that's my, I think that's my um, analog AI. Um, professionally, being in the marketing space and the content creating space, I use it almost every day. I produce articles, I write emails and I use it. I also find AI in professional ways using spread. I'm not, I'm not very good in math. And with AI, my whole issue with spreadsheets is a thing of a past because now I'm, I'm very confident using it and applying all those formulas, uh, with, with ease. What is the best way for someone, an entrepreneur, business owner, a partner, someone that's uh, running a business, what's the best way for them to get up to speed with what they can do with generative AI? The The problem is with, with the AI hype is that there's so much information out there. It's so much. So I think the the art is to get rid of stuff and really focus on a few new sources that you can rely on. I've, um, I've done the legwork. I have, um, tried a lot. I've signed up to a lot. I, you know, also subscribe to a lot, spent a pretty penny on those subscriptions, canceled them and basically zoned into, um, the AI exchange. It's worth every penny. I think it's 150 bucks per year. Um, and I think, that is a community where you can constantly learn because they already select things for you that is important. So they do the legwork. And then, then is there is the um, marketing AI, the AI Marketing Institute with Paul Retzer. Fantastic. Um, they do events all the time. There are actually free um, introductory courses um, each month that people can take in the marketing space and then decide if they want to become a member and fantastic source. And then I have, meanwhile, a couple of friends who are in this space that I can learn from. It's fantastic. What's a book that you recommend the most to people? So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I studied Russian literature and to this day, I, <laughs> my favorite, favorite book is from Bulgakov. Master Margarita, it also exists in English. Phenomenal, because on a philosophical level, it is so layered. So the, the basic story is um, Soviet Union in the 20s, and politics and life and society, everything is surrounded around housing. So the, the problem of getting an apartment is omnipresent. And there are forces at work um, and there are schemes to get an apartment. Um, it's all political. There's a murder mystery. And the parallel story is um, actually a biblical one. It plays in Jerusalem and it's the internal turmoil Pontius Pilatus has 
battle, <laughs> battling his migraine and ending up saying, okay, Jesus needs to be put on the cross and the reason behind it. So those two parallel stories, it's very multi-layered, but I can, somebody who likes to read and think, that's my favorite book. And then I have um, others, obviously, uh, that are more popular. And uh, then there is a writer called Juna Barnes. She's a suffragette, uh, American, traveled Europe with Henry Miller and and those creative people uh, also in the first part of the 20th century. That's also very interesting reads. Not easy ones, but interesting ones. Excellent. Is there something that you've changed your mind about recently? And if so, what is it? <sighs> Have I changed my mind about something? Cutting me off guard here. Mm. Maybe America. What's changed? The politics, I think, are as such that I have a hard time to say, okay, I want to move back. I always said I want to, I, you know, would love to move back to America because I, I really enjoyed uh, living there for 20 years. I, um, I think over the years I've lost all my exoticism and I just blended in with everybody else. I think recent political manifestations make it hard for me to say, okay, I, I can actually, even my daughter says she doesn't even want to go to a university in the States and she's, she is American. And um, so I hope that things will settle for the better. So that's, I think where I changed my mind. You've, you've lived uh, all over the world. You've traveled all over the world. What is your favorite city in the world? <laughs> it's New York. Yeah, I've lived there also for eight years. I was visiting last year. And uh, it changed, but it's still the same. To me, actually, I posted on my Instagram, which is not a public profile, First thing I did when I um, when I arrived was I went to Brooklyn Bagels on 26th Street and I got myself the biggest sesame bagel and some schmear and some lox and I was just in heaven. I think that that's the best bagel anywhere and I love them. Um, and then following is, I think, Paris. I love those answers. So I just have a lightning round of questions, and these are just for fun. Favorite candy bar? Um, Twix. Favorite musical artist? Oh, that's an easy one. Prince. Prince and Prince. Favorite cereal? Um, just simple, plain old cornflakes. Mac or PC? Mac all the way. Google or Microsoft? Google. Dogs or cats? Cats. Dogs too. Phantom or Les Mis? Uh, Les Mis. Awesome. I know they're they're watching the clock over here and they're going to kick us out. I would love to continue the conversation, maybe even over Zoom, uh, maybe have a part two to this since it's been so shotgun and short. Uh, but thank you, Jeanette, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to meet with me this morning. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, we were able to connect through section. I hope our paths cross again and that we can continue the conversation in a part two. Thank you so much, Carl. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. What's the brief, dear brand? <laughs>